argument. This is mere rhetoric. The horse sequence has proved vexed to everyone who looks at it, and the term of choice is that it's an astonishingly bushy sequence. It, we don't please know. Explain, please explain the problem. When I'm, you I'm waiting for the answer. When you look at what the a bushy fossil, sequence is. Yeah, this is, a, this is a term that's occurred very often in literature. When we look at the horse sequence, we have dozens and dozens um, of species entering the record suddenly and departing from the record suddenly just as abruptly as they oh. entered. We do not really know whether the modern horse has ancestral patterns with the dozens of other species that we find in the fossil record. So what if that means is closely, that you hold look, open, wait you a hold, sure, go ahead. If we look closely at some of the amazing structures, for example, oh, we find it very difficult I'm sorry. We find it very difficult to find specific antecedents. The more we study such structures, the less plausible it is that they have an ancestral okay, let me pattern. Suggest, let me suggest to the audience that what Dr. Berlinski just said is, in fact, not correct. And I can recommend articles and books in which you can find not only a series of transitional forms, but also good evolutionary morphologic explanations yes, for it. I agree and with here's that. the question that I have for you. I agree Once with again, that. Let, let's to get someone who advocates on the in, another question. To someone who advocates record. intelligent design. I don't. The fact to someone who advocates intelligent design, does the sequence of these organisms in the fossil record simply mean that the intelligent designer was incompetent, he kept making things and they went instinct, extinct? or that he was restless, I try this, I'll try that, I'll try the other thing, or does it mean that in fact these organisms are related with descent, by descent with modification? No idea. I mean, it's not a question I'm prepared to answer one way or another. I don't see why I'm obliged to answer that. I'm coming here under the large tent of objurgation. I find scientific flaws with the Darwinian theory. I don't have a replacement. Okay. The, 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 the point that I think is extremely significant is in this case, one side argued from authentic evidence and the other side said, it's not enough to convince me. And I think that's a good way to end the discussion. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Closing arguments. Closing arguments. First, Barry Lynn closing for the opposition. Well, I hope that uh, our side at least has done what uh, I promised we would do from the beginning, and that is we have asked for alternative explanations for evolution, and we have gotten none. What have we gotten? Well, we have Mr. Berlinski, who has literally moments, seconds ago, said he doesn't really have an alternative. We asked Mr. Behe. He said, well, a lot of people would say it was God, but we're not quite sure, I'm not sure at least, whether he's prepared to say it's God with any sense of authority. Mr. Johnson says, well, I don't know about the biblical answers as an alternative. We'll work that out after we debunk evolution, which I think will be some time from now. We've made it clear that evolution is not a philosophy. It's not a religious idea. It's not an ideology. It's the best. Indeed, it's the only scientific explanation for the fact that there is change in the natural order. We asked about intelligent design and uh, got, I think, the best answer from Mr. Behe. Mr. Behe has, of course, compared, like it or not, compared the extraordinary complexity of this human cell to the mouse trap. He said, if we look at that mouse trap, uh, it was created by a human. In fact, Mr. Mr. Miller improved on it, as you saw earlier tonight. Therefore, in, if that's complicated, then indeed the cell must also have been designed by an intelligence. And as I thought about it tonight, it's a little bit, we were all talking about nature analogies. It's a little bit like uh, looking at a mole build a mole hill. You say, that's very interesting. Then we walk out in the woods the next day and we notice a big mountain off in the distance. We say, good grief, that's enormously large. A really big mole must have built that. The truth of the matter is, it's not logical. We should be looking for different forces that result in different things. Uh, your mousetrap was built by human hands because its components are inanimate objects. Cellular life is living, vibrant, breathing, changing matter. You're not just comparing apples to oranges, you're comparing plastic apples to organic oranges. And I think, therefore, this analogy fails. Let me close by saying, and speaking only for myself, because we do have a di difference of religious opinion, I draw upon a scriptural passage which is dear to both Mr. Johnson and to myself. It comes from the first chapter of John's Gospel. It reads, in the beginning was the word. Indeed, that word just might turn out literally to have been a command, evolved. Thank you very much.
Uh, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> I, I compliment uh, the negative on uh, the way in which their arguments uh, have been framed. What uh, is it that we set out to say here, uh, namely that uh, the notion of creation uh, has not been invalidated <clears throat> by, uh, by uh, whatever loyalty is shown to the idea of, uh, of um, evolution. That is to say, <clears throat> uh, we, we, do, we use, have used the word intelligent design uh, in order to reach for something that uh, is not biblical in dimension, but nevertheless suggests that, that uh, the, the miracles with which we are familiar are most probably miracles that didn't happen simply by chance. I think we all have reason to celebrate, <clears throat> the, in effect, the uh, repudiation of materialist uh, explanations uh, that um, have been so studiously uh, 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 observed by our eloquent uh, adversaries. So let me just <clears throat> close by reading uh, one paragraph from an essay written 20 years after Darwin. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> in 1864, <clears throat> there was a diocesan conference at Oxford. It chanced at this time to be in the neighborhood a man who was neither priest nor scientist, a man given to absurd freaks of intellectual short solitary yet showing at times also such marvelous and sudden penetration into the heart of things as would come only to genius. It was Disraeli. He began in his usual affected manner slowly and rather pompously, as if he had uh, nothing to say beyond the perfunctory platitudes. And then, turning to the presiding officer, uh, he uttered one of his enigmatic and unforgettable epigrams. What is the question now placed before society? Uh, the question is this, is man an ape or an angel. I, my lord, am on the side of the angels. The audience, not kindly disposed to the speaker, uh, applauded the words as a jest. They were carried the next day over the whole land by the newspapers. They have often been repeated as an example of Disraeli's brilliant but empty wit. I suspect that beneath their surface glitter and hidden within their metaphor, these words contain a truth that shall someday break to pieces the new philosophy which Huxley spent his life so devotedly to establish. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Walker. <laughs> well, I'm glad that's settled. <laughs> um, I'd like to thank our debaters, and I'd like to thank Seton Hall University, and I'm not going to tax anyone with my voice any longer. I apologize for that. And uh, I guess we'll know in a few million years who's right and who's wrong about this. Thank you very much.